I'm out on the West Coast. So after his PhD, he did a postdoc in Eric Elm's lab at um, MIT, where he focused on developing techniques to quantify individual specific eco-evolutionary dynamics within the human gut microbiome. And so again, as he's built his career at the Institute for Systems Biology, you can see where he's been integrating all of these. So he's currently an associate professor um, at the Institute in Seattle. He studies ecology and evolution of microbial communities, in particular how host-associated bacterial communities influence health and wellness of the host organism. And um, I think what's very cool about his work is that he works in both computational as well as wet lab space, so he's bridging both of those. And his long-term aim is to develop strategies for engineering the ecology of the gut microbiome to improve human health. And he has about 90 papers in very high impact journal, a couple of the nature journals, um, and his work is already very highly cited and is supported by NIH as well as a recent global um, grant for gut health. And um, so again, we're very excited for his presentation, but before I'm going to embarrass him for a second, because as a pioneer um, seminar speaker, we have a, a small um, picture for you. So if you'd like to come up for... I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Sharon. That, thanks for the very warm welcome and the kind introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers for having me out. I'm excited to be here. It's, it's my first time in Illinois in, in a few years. Um, I always like coming back to visit. And it's my first time at UIUC. And I've, I've known a lot of people here for a long time. It's a great place. And I've, I've always wanted to, to visit and kind of go to the, the pilgrimage to see where Carl Woes worked, essentially, right? Um, okay, so today uh, I'm going to talk a lot about metabolic modeling. That'll be kind of the focus of, of the talk today. We do other stuff in the lab, but this is, this is something I'm particularly excited about now. We have a couple of preprints in this, in this space. Uh, the basic idea is we want to try to, you know, engineer the gut microbiome for human health. So we know that uh, there, are, there are these various filters on our, our, our phenotype, right? So we're exposed to lots of stuff. We eat a banana, we take Tylenol. Um, we're, you know, throughout the course of our development, um, you know, whether we go down a disease or health trajectory or have some sort of unique response to an input is def defined by, by certain things, including our genotype. Uh, it's been 23 years since we've sequenced the, the human genome. Um, but the more we learn day by day, uh, if there's a new nature paper out every week, it seems, uh, about how this thing called the microbiome is affecting our responses to environmental exposures, to diet, to drugs. Um, it's an important component of our phenotype, and it defines how, how we respond. And it's a heck of a lot more plastic than your genome. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to modulate the ecology of the gut. Not, not easy, but easier than to, say, CRISPR modify all your somatic cells. So there's a lot of potential here for, for making an impact on human health. Um, and I would say there's a few ways in which the microbiome affects host physiology and health. Um, one major um, route is through antigen immune interactions. Um, I won't talk about that today. Like people like Michael Fishbach's lab are doing really cool stuff in that arena. Um, what I'm talking, talking about today are small molecules. Um, the microbiome can be thought of as, a, as an anaerobic bioreactor. Um, it's sitting down here in, inside of our guts. Uh, it, it processes myriad dietary inputs, so tens of thousands of dietary substrates that we take in are being chewed up by these organisms. Also, host substrates like mucus or bile acids are being modulated or chewed up or, or modified by our microbiota into a bunch of stuff. A lot of it's bioactive, and a lot of it gets absorbed into the bloodstream and circulates throughout the body and has distal impacts on all the various systems and, and organs of the body. Uh, we just had a paper out last year where we found, you know, it was, it was an analysis of the genomic, human genomic microbiome contributions to, to explaining the variation in the, in the blood metabolome, and we found that half, about half of all the metabolites circulating in your bloodstream are associated with variation, cross-sectional variation in the composition of the microbiome, and that actually beat the genome by a, by a mile. You know, at least in the context of the genomic variation we had in a 2,000-person cohort, um, you know, about half of the metabolites were associated with the microbiome, and maybe like 10% of the metabolites were associated with variation in the genome. So 
We know there's this really complicated interplay, this conversation, crosstalk going on between the metabolites produced by our microbiota and our bodies. We don't have a, Ro a Rosetta Stone for kind of translating what's, what's being said in this conversation, and that is the task that's ahead of us, is trying to understand this, this conversation. Um, I was almost gonna throw this slide up, but then I heard that there was like an AI group that, that was interested in, in the talk, and so I do frame this a little bit in terms of artificial intelligence or AI. It's a bit of a buzzword. Um, but, you know, there are two flavors, I would say, of artificial intelligence research. Uh, the one that's really exciting and popular right now that we all know a lot about because of things like uh, chat GTP, GPT, I always get that mixed up. <laughs> GPT, that's right. Uh, where you have a, a body of data, a corpus of knowledge, and you, and you train an algorithm to make predictions based on that information. So you're kind of extracting knowledge from the world. That, that's like neural nets and machine learning and all that. That's the statistical side of AI, I would say. But if you go back to the old days of artificial intelligence research, there was a lot of symbolic AI. Um, so people were trying to hard code knowledge into equations, you know, like Newtonian mechanics or you know, whatever kind of knowledge you have that you can code into an, an equation-like format uh, and then use that to make predictions about a complex system. And in you know, systems biology, which I'm in a systems biology institute, these things are often framed as knowledge graphs, right? So metabolic networks, for example, or transcription factor binding networks. These are known interactions between entities that you can kind of code mathematically and use that information to make predictions. And that's, that's more where we fall. You, you probably have seen the, an example of the statistical AI approach um, from, you know, for example, Ron, Ron Segal and Ron Elinov's group. Uh, this is from a few years ago. Uh, I'm sure folks here are familiar with this work. Really cool paper. They, were, they had an Israeli population. They collected a bunch of data on their diet, on their microbiomes, clinical markers, and so on. Used it to train, I believe it was a random forest type model, some sort of tree-based model to predict optimal diets for these folks. And what they were looking for as far as optimum was glucose spiking. So they were tracking uh, response in glucose uh, post-meal. And they could design uh, optimal diets that um, made your blood glucose spike less in green here, and bad diets that made it spike more, uh, which you know, pushes you more towards prediabetes and diabetes. They could do this using you know, experts, so nutritionists who would design diets, and then they had their algorithmic diet, and they performed similarly well. Um, recently, I think there's a cool update to this work where uh, you know, this, this company, Day2, has actually come out of this, this work kind of precision nutrition, uh, and they did a head-to-head -head comparison between their algorithmic diet and the, the Mediterranean diet, and they found that they did better for most people. Right, so for, for most of these subjects, there was a you know, mit, more mitigated glucose spiking in the precision design diet than there was in the Mediterranean diet. Um, and for a couple folks, it didn't really matter either way. There was a few non-significant differences here. Um, but that was, a, that was an important proof of concept because a lot of nutritionists were saying, you know, why, not, why don't you just eat a Mediterranean diet? Right? Everybody knows that's good for you. But, but maybe there's something more to, to it than that. So that's, that's the statistical side. I think there's a huge uh, potential for work in that space, uh, but you know, this is what we're tackling at the moment, uh, taking a mechanistic modeling approach to trying to make predictions about the, the functional outputs of the microbiome. Uh, and essentially, it's, it's genome scale metabolic modeling. This is uh, just a beautiful but almost totally uninformative hairball of, of what one of these networks look like. Uh, so you, know, you have reactions re uh, and metabolites here. They're, 70,000 reactions, almost 50,000 metabolites, and almost 300,000 connections in this hairball. These regions of high density are, are individual taxa, like a species in, in the gut microbiome, uh, and these internal um, edges are a sort of internal fluxes going on inside the cell. Uh, and then, you know, it's harder to see, but there are these edges crossing the boundaries between these cells, and those are cross-feeding interactions between taxa in these, in these models. So, what my lab is trying to do is extend classical single organism genome scale metabolic modeling uh, in high throughput to these big community models where you have a lot of reactions and a lot of organisms that have in the past been intractable to, to get solutions to. Um, I know not everybody's familiar with flux balance analysis, so I thought I'd give a really quick primer on that. Um, it's just a way to take a bunch of you know, um, dynamical equations, essentially. You could model metabolism as a bunch of differential equations that are coupled, um, but you, finding a solution to that with thousands and thousands of reactions is not feasible. 
So what FBA does is it projects that down into like a, um, a linear algebra, essentially. Uh, it, it makes some assumptions uh, and then makes it essentially vectors and, and, uh, and, and matrices. So you start off with a stoichiometric matrix and a flux vector V. You make an assumption that's the steady state assumption, which is that the inputs and the outputs are balanced with one another. That helps you define a subspace in this really big problem. Uh, and then you can bound, you, you can pr provide bounds or constraints to, to these fluxes based on data like thermodynamic information you have, enzymatic rates, um, composition of the medium, so on and so forth. What this looks like in practice, um, you know, how do you encode one of these S matrices? Well, here's a simple metabolic um, reaction network where you have reactions R1 through R6. You have metabolites A, B, C, and D. Uh, and you can see, so for example, reaction two, it consumes metabolite A uh, and it produces metabolite B. And if you go over here, yeah, consumes A, produces B, yes. So it's a, it's a way to account for all these um, interac interactions between reactions and metabolites. So it's, it's just a stoichiometry. Uh, and what you solve for is the V vector, right? It's the flux vector, which is how much mass is actually flowing through any given reaction in the system. Um, and how do you do that? Well, here's, here's an example of a two-flux space where you, you, you've satisfied your steady state uh, here in blue. So you've limited you know, an infinite space of solutions to a smaller but still infinite subspace of solutions. Uh, and you can find a single solution in this space. In particular, if you, say, maximize flux through V5, there's a single point here that's, that's a single optimum. Or you can maximize through V6 and you get a single point here. And so the name of the game is finding some maximization, having some convexity to this problem that allows you to find a unique solution in the space. Usually what we're maximizing for in bacteria is biomass production. And that tends to be a decent assumption um, for bacteria. They like to grow really fast and maximize their, their reproductive potential and thus maximize biomass production. But um, you know, before I get too deep into the weeds of this, uh, all of this assumes steady state, that, that bugs are growing more or less um, exponentially when they're, exiting, uh, <laughs> when they're exiting the gut. Sorry, technical difficulties. I'll try not to gesticulate as wild wildly. Um, but is that the case? Are things actually growing fast when, when you poop? You know, are those bugs still cooking? And uh, long story short, I would argue yes, but here's some evidence. Um, so we just had a paper out in Nature Communications, Joe Lim is the first author, where we tried to explore this idea of like, what is the growth phase of bacteria in situ, in, in the gut? Um, the basic model we have in our heads of, of the human gut is that there's not a lot of growth going on uh, above the colon. You know, the host is doing its darndest to kill everything up there, to have pri pri prime access essentially to dietary nutrition. So, we want to be the first dibs on sugars and fats and everything else. So we get the pH real low and we produce a lot of antimicrobial compounds and kill off most stuff. There's still action going on up there, but the vast amount of biomass and growth is actually in the colon um, and it's boom and bust. So you have a bolus of food, you eat a, some amount of food, a meal, and it's traveling as a semi-discrete bolus down through the system. It starts off with zero microbes in it, uh, gut microbes in it. Uh, and it ends up at 10 to the 11 bacterial cells per gram in feces, which I think is the most microbially dense substance in the known universe. Um, so there's a lot of internal dynamics, right? All, and I would argue that most of the population dynamics going on in the human microbiome is internal. And then what we sample is a steady state endpoint of this internal dynamic. So we're getting these average abundances of bugs over time. Um, and we don't quite know if, for example, taxon 3 has essentially hit its, its stationary phase uh, in growth, or if you're in taxon 1's category where you're still ramping up and growing exponentially at the time the poop drops out of the system. All we observe is that we have these average abundances that are pretty stable over the long term. Um, so this, some of my postdoc work look, looked into this. If you look across most of the abundant taxa in the human gut for healthy people that aren't undergoing some major perturbation, you get nice stability, right? This, this average abundance, this carrying capacity, whatever it is, is pretty rock solid over months to years timescales. Um, and then if you plot, you know, if you want to ask, are, are these fluctuations actually related to some sort of internal dynamic, um, you can plot the uh, change in abundance from time step one to time step two and the abundance at time step one. 
for every taxon in the system and you universally see something like this. So this is just one bug across three different time series, or sorry, four different time series. And there's a strong negative association between your change in abundance and your steady, your, your sort of observed abundance. So if you're you know, at your average carrying capacity, you're kind of in the middle here. Um, if you are above your uh, carrying capacity, there's a negative delta. Uh, I didn't put positive and negative on the y-axis just for simplicity, but you have a negative delta down here to pushes you back towards your steady, your carrying capacity. If you're found to be below your carrying capacity, you tend to have a positive delta at the next time point. That could be an active process. That could also just be regression to the mean. Right? So if you have some steady state abundance and you fluctuate, if you sample out here on the tail at the next time point, you're very likely to randomly sample closer to the mean. Uh, and, and I suspect that this is the case because it's almost too good to be true. Like every single bug you look at in the entire system across any person you look at looks about like this, about the same R squared. That's like too good of a signal to, to not be something like regression to the mean, in my opinion. However, there's another way you can measure growth rate in the gut, which is peak to trough ratios. And if you're not familiar, um, this is a trick that was learned by Karem et al. another uh, Ron Segal lab paper in science back in 2015. Uh, e. coli can uh, double, it can, can split its cell and, and double every 20 minutes, but it takes about 50 minutes for it to replicate its genome. How does it do that magic? It has to parallelize genome replication. So E. coli has many replication forks going at once. It's almost this kind of fractal, like, you know, blossoming of replication forks at the origin of replication. And there's a bunch of DNA that aggregates towards that origin, and there's less DNA on average towards the terminus. So if you pop a cell that's growing really fast and you map the short reads back to a, a, the chromosome, and with the origin at one side and the terminus at the other, there's, there's an asymmetry in the read pileup. And so you get reads piling up towards the origin and fast growing taxa, and the steepness of that pileup is related to its growth rate, in vitro at least. It's been validated with many organisms grown in vitro that this is the case. And you can get this snapshot measure, this PTR measure, for organisms at least that are abundant in the human gut. And when we look at the relationship between this PTR growth rate proxy and abundance in time series from these four different people where we have dense metagenomic time series, you get a variety of relationships, right? It's not like the, the other plot I was showing. It's not uniform. Sometimes you get a positive relationship, sometimes you get a negative, sometimes you get a null. So there's something more sophisticated going on here. Uh, can we use this to back out something about dynamics or, or what's going on inside the system? Um, so this is now taking us to a little bit of math, but not too much. Uh, the logistic growth equation is, is fairly simple, right? You have your growth rate R, kind of your maximal growth rate. Uh, your abundance at time t uh, t multiplied by this term, 1 minus your abundance divided by k, which is a carrying capacity. So it defines how, how abundant you can get. It's self-limiting growth. You know, if you know Jacques Minaud's work, you know kind of this, this type of dynamic. Um, and it, it's very general. It's very phenomenological. Uh, and it describes how most organisms grow. They start off at low abundance. They kind of grow exponentially for a while. And they taper off and are limited in their growth to some carrying capacity. If you look at the first and second derivatives of this curve, you can see that you know, in the middle here, you're maximizing your rate of growth, which is the first derivative. And then the acceleration of growth is the second derivative. You're positively accelerating in your growth in the beginning of the curve, and you're decelerating in growth towards the end of the curve. So this made us think we could use this type of framing to maybe understand these varying statistical relationships between PTRs and abundances. If we saw a positive relationship, we might expect organisms to be in this acceleration phase of the growth curve. If we see a negative relationship, we may expect things to be more pushed towards the deceleration part of the curve. Yeah, and, and, and you want to put that in terms of pooping frequency, right? Uh, slow poopers are going to be more here. Uh, fast poopers are going to be more here, right? The faster you poop, the less time organisms have to, to reach their carrying capacity. So if you simulate this with a stochastic logistic growth equation, which you, know, you have to do for a paper, um, this is what it looks like. You, know, you, you, you get what you expect. You get the same sort of associations, but with more noise, because it's stochastic. Um, then it, uh, we can do this in vitro, where we grow E. coli in a flask and sample it really densely over its growth curve and measure its um, peak to trough ratio and its abundance at these varying parts of the curve. And we see what we expect, right? Positive, kind of neutral, negative, and then you know, here's stationary phase where your PTR is kind of collapsed to its lowest point 
Um, so perhaps we can use this as a way to tell us something about an in vivo growth phase. We applied it to the four data sets where we had enough um, time series data to, to get these measurements. Uh, and this is what we find. Um, for all these different taxa that are more or less um, you know, detected across these four individuals as the columns here, um, some are predicted to be kind of in deceleration or even stationary phase. Some are predicted to be in acceleration phase. Some are gray, which is, you know, there's no association. That could be you're underpowered to see an association, or it could be that it's in mid-log phase. It's hard to tell the difference. But since the average PTR is higher than our stationarity threshold, we, we assume that it's still growing pretty fast, right? So it's not, it's not in stationary phase. Uh, one cool pattern we found is it's, it's very low N, but two of these people were faster poopers than the other two. Uh, they poop twice a day, I believe, and this is people who poop between once a day and once every other day. Uh, and the slower poopers had more blue in their columns. The faster poopers had more orange in their columns on average. And that sort of fits our mental model of what we think is going on. We need more dense time series to kind of show this in a larger population. Um, but long story short, if we average across the dynamics and look at the average PTR and the average abundance of all the taxa across these four different people, there's a significant, albeit noisy, positive association between your growth rate and your abundance. And what that tells me is that things are growing exponentially. Right? If, if things were growing exponentially in the gut, you would expect a positive association between growth rate and abundance. So I'm sort of justifying my, <laughs> the rest of the presentation, essentially. Um, so th that's, that's just A, me, me presenting a new paper we just put out, and B, kind of trying to justify the fact that we do believe that many of the abundant tax in the gut are still actively growing at the point of defecation, which means that FBA models might be appropriate for, for this system. It's also empirically true that if we take poop out of someone's body into the anaerobic chamber, we mix it up in some PBS buffer and just let it sit without putting anything in it, it's like bubbling and doing stuff, right? If there's still food in there and the bugs are still growing. So back to community scale metabolic modeling. I have a really talented research scientist in my group, uh, Christian Diener, who built this model called MyCom, or it's more of a kind of software platform that enables people to construct these community scale metabolic models. Um, what do you need in order to construct a model? Well, you need, you need a bunch of metabolic models for the various tax in the system. Um, you could build those yourself if you're, you know, uh, bespoke, if you want to have bespoke kind of hipster Brooklyn style, you know, uh, microbiomes. You can also take them off the shelf. Um, Agora, for example, is a, is a database of these metabolic models, and they have hundreds, if not thousands, of these gut microbes in their database that you can just pull down. So you need to have those models. You can take sequencing data from an individual person. So I sequence your gut. I get the abundances of all the taxa and the composition of who's there. I map that taxonomy to the database, pull down the models for those taxa, adjust their abundances to what I see in your system, and that's the initial condition for your digital gut, right, that we're building. Next, you have to have a dietary input. Um, that's uh, a constraint that we impose. It's sometimes hard to have really good data on someone's diet, but we have a bunch of off-the-shelf ones that we can use, like the standard um, European diet, standard American diet, uh, Mediterranean diet, and a few others. So we could just feed you one of those, or we could try to make a bespoke diet for you. Uh, one step that's important for the diet is um, we use the human recon 3D metabolic model to actually pull down the metabolites that are known to be absorbed by the human being in the small intestine. So those are depleted prior to feeding it to the colon. And we also inject a few metabolites that we know the microbe, the, the body is injecting into the diet, which is uh, mucus, for example, uh, and bile acids. So after some fiddling with the diet, we feed that to the, to the system. Uh, and then, you know, at the end, we get, uh, we get various things. We get growth rates for all the different taxa that are different. Uh, and this is actually a bit of a trick um, because classical um, steady state models don't really give you this, but I'll talk about it. Uh, and then you get all the cross-feeding going on between all the taxa in the system, something that would be very difficult to measure in situ. Uh, but we get these predictions from the model. We use something called cooperative trade-off FBA, which, which I will talk about next that I think distinguishes what we're doing from a lot of prior um, attempts at this type of approach. So um, the best way to do this kind of modeling is probably dynamic FBA, if you're familiar with that approach. We're actually like slicing up 
the solution into a bunch of little pieces and then trying to simulate the dynamics of going from no growth, where you have no, nobody in the system with any biomass, to the kind of end point where you have the various abundances you observe. Um, but that takes a long time, especially for a big community with lots of species and a lot of reactions. So steady state methods are fast, where you just have a single optimum, like biomass maximization. And for an, a single bug, that works pretty darn well. Um, but in uh, groups that do this community type modeling, steady state modeling, they often use community level biomass as an optimum. And that, is, that, that is, has a problem uh, associated with it, <laughs> in that it's completely unrealistic, right? Uh, it usually leads to a situation where one taxon or a few taxa are growing and everything else sacrifices its own biomass to allow that organism to grow. Uh, and that's not very realistic. So how, how do we get around this? Um, so just to give you an example of the problem, say we have two organisms here and the maximal community growth is this line. Um, there's you know, infinite solutions essentially on this line uh, where you could either pile all your growth rate into organism one or pile it all into organism two. The solvers that are classically used for, for solving these optimization problems often try to pick a solution that's near an edge. So you usually get a solution that one bug is growing in these types of models. We impose uh, an L2 penalty here on this, which kind of pushes things to the center. Uh, and we use the observed abundance distribution as a constraint on that penalty. So essentially, it's pushing the growth rates towards um, the abundance distribution we observe. And as I explained previously, we think that that might be a decent assumption. Uh, another piece to this is we allow for suboptimal community growth. So we allow it, the, the system to make a little bit less biomass than the maximal optimum. And this is based on empirical data where we've seen in these small synthetic communities that as you mix together more and more diverse sets of taxa, you see that the total biomass that's achievable actually starts to decline slightly in more and more diverse communities. So we think there's some small cost to interaction that, that is imposed on total biomass of the system. So if we, if we impose these, these kind of heuristics, uh, we end up getting an approximation of a dynamic solution. Um, and we have a little perspective we wrote on this, on this point. Uh, this is what dynamic FBA will try to do, right? It starts from a point of no growth, takes a bunch of little steps towards your, your end point where your, your steady state growth uh, abundance profiles are, and then it will step you back actually to um, stationary phase. Uh, it gives you the, kind of the, full, the full dynamic uh, loop there. There are a couple methods that are steady state that approximate the dynamics. Uh, steady com is one that takes this sort of, um, uh, uh, what, do you, what would you call it, a, a parallel kind of line approach. Um, it's, it's sort of sensitive to really low abundance things in the system, so it breaks very easily. Ours is a little more robust. It's fairly similar in that it, it, you, you, you find essentially the, the shortest path between no growth and the endpoint of dynamics. So as long as you assume that bugs are trying to grow as fast, get, get to that point of maximal biomass as fast as they can, um, then ours, our, our, our method is a bit of an approximation of dynamic FBA. And I apologize if that was too in the weeds for, for some folks. You can, you can get more detail by, by reading these papers, but it's sort of what distinguishes the, the approach a bit from, from other approaches. Um, I, I mentioned we're using Agora for the most part, so all, everything I'm gonna present from here on out is actually leveraging these Agora models. They're not perfect. I know people have issues with them. Uh, the, the Agora one is actually fairly well curated and they fix some of the bugs. And in our hands, it's, it's, doing, it's doing okay. But as these model databases get better and better curated, um, the, the models themselves will only improve, right? So we can only go up from here. So, okay, that's prelude ex explaining the model. What can we do with these types of models? We can do a lot of really fun stuff. Um, so, for example, uh, the original use case of, of, of MyCom was to explore interactions between taxa in a system. Um, so this is an example of one person's microbiome that we've s created a, a community scale model for. We're feeding them a standard uh, European diet. And now we can knock out every individual taxon in the system and see how that affects the growth rates of everything else in the system. Um, so for example, if you knock out Bacteroides, you can see a bunch of red lines coming off of it, meaning that it has a lot of competitive interactions with the other tax in the system. The growth rates of other organisms actually increase a fair amount when you knock out Bacteroides. Alternatively, if you knock out Acromancia, um, there's a lot of blue lines coming off of it. 
And uh, so a lot of organisms' biomass actually declines if you knock acromancy out of the system. So it allows us to do these types of um, complicated um, multivariate, you know, met metabolome space interaction plots. Uh, you can't really do these experiments in, in, in the real world for the most part, maybe, maybe a little bit in less complicated communities. But the problem is it's really hard to validate this type of a thing. So, um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about how we are trying to validate these models in the context of precision nutrition. So ideally, from a kind of clinical translational perspective, we want to create a digital twin of your gut that we can boot up and simulate interventions on. If so if, if I feed you a banana, if I gave you a probiotic, what happens to you? Uh, and it's very clear from the literature that there are responders and non-responders to interventions, right? People have a heterogeneous responses, and a lot of that is driven by the microbiota. Um, so the first example is short-chain fatty acid production. So uh, if you squint, the microbiome is essentially a SCFA-producing organ. Right? Uh, dietary fibers are taken in in, in, in the diet, uh, and they're fermented into acetate, propionate, and butyrate. That's the, the, by mass, the dominant metabolic output of the gut. And if I gave everybody in this room a banana, different SFA profiles would come out your butts. Everyone's different, right? And we don't know how to explain it. This is just one paper where they did ex vivo cultivation of stool um, for a bunch of different people. People are rows here acetate, propionate, and butyrate, and you can see the profiles are pretty all over the map, right? For inulin and pectin interventions, you get quite different profiles of short-chain fatty acids out the other side. Uh, so Nick Bowman in the lab uh, decided to take on this pretty ambitious project along with Christian. So how do you validate um, the models? The models predict fluxes. They don't predict concentrations, they predict fluxes. So you need um, you know, amounts over time, you know, production or consumption. In, in order to get that, you have to take poop out of the body. Uh, and you have to also take the host out of the equation because when it comes to short-chain fatty acids, the host epithelium is just sucking them up and breaking them down almost instantaneously. So you know, if you're getting SCFAs in poop, you're actually not measuring, likely you're not measuring the in-situ production very well by looking at a concentration in stool. Same goes for plasma. They're correlated, but noisily, right? They're not, they're not very correlated. So we have a... Uh, uh, um, a project called Gut Puzzle going on right now, collaboration with the Fred Hutch, where we're getting poop from 100 different people. Uh, within 30 minutes of deposit, we're grabbing it and we're running it over to ISB, getting into our anaerobic chamber. We're mixing it up into a soup or a slurry uh, in PBS buffer. And then to that slurry, we add very specific macronutrient interventions. So inulin, pectin, casein, uh, various dietary components, and do time series metabolomics to look at the consumption and production profiles uh, for various people's microbiota for the same dietary input. And so for this uh, particular analysis, we focus on dietary fibers. Uh, and this is just uh, some, of the, some of the first results we have. Um, this first plot on the left is data from our collaborator, Ophelia Venturelli, where she creates these synthetic communities of gut microbes um, in vitro. So just putting together individual taxa and then growing them on a medium. So they're all grown on the same exact medium. Uh, She's measuring butyrate production over the course of a couple of hours. Uh, and so, you know, these are all 10 plus uh, species rich communities, uh, 700 of them, I believe. And we get a, you know, an R of about 0.52 for our um, predicted um, model based butyrate production versus the measured. Um, you know, not great, but significant. Um, and we're, again, we're not fitting anything here. There's no statistical fitting going on. This is a, a mechanistic model. Uh, making predictions based on the genome scale models of these organisms. So that's for 10 species communities. What about for, for more complex communities, ex vivo communities? So this is human stool now, um, looking across acetate, butyrate, and propionate. Um, and we're getting actually slightly better uh, prediction for these, these stool communities. About 0.6 is the R for butyrate and propionate. Now acetate has been a bit of a, uh, a sticky issue for us. It's been harder to predict. Um, partly because it's an overflow metabolite. There's a lot of ways to make acetate. And in a, for, for a given biomass optimization, um, you can actually get a wide range of acetate out outputs that are consistent with that optimum. So we are kind of ignoring acetate for now uh, as I move forward. 
But at least for butyrate and for pionate, we get decent prediction, and these two seem to be more coupled to biomass, essentially. Um, that, so this is that same ex vivo data plotted in a different way. Now we've actually added these various fiber interventions to these, uh, to these communities. Control is just PBS buffer, pectin, inulin, and then FOS as three different dietary fibers. You can see that acetate is giving us really bad predictions, as I, as I kind of mentioned, but we see fairly consistent associations and predictions for um, butyrate and propionate. And that's true both within treatment and across treatments. It's a little hard to see, but the R's are, about, are, are fairly consistent. Um, we actually can juice up the R quite a bit when we have a more dilute stool sample and we add a large amount of in vitro fiber and the treatment effect becomes very large in that scenario, and the model's very good at predicting that. Um, the model gets a little noisier when you have a bunch of residual dietary fiber left in, in the matrix um, because it's a less dilute sample, and you have to try to infer what that dietary fiber composition is, and so you get noisier predictions. But ultimately, once we have better constraints on dietary inputs and better constraints on, on having, having nicer models, um, these should only improve from where they are currently, which is about a R of 0.5 to 0.6. This is robust, uh, no, no matter if you do a genus or a, a um, species level model. So we took down um, metagenomic data and 16S data. In 16S data, we're limited to using genus level taxonomy because you can't get down to species level for most taxa. Uh, so for data sets, archival data sets that only have that data um, associated with them, there's good news, those solutions are actually correlated with the metagenomic data. So for data sets where we have both data types for the same samples, we get correlated solutions. Um, and at the species and genus level, we get correlated solutions as well. Although you tend to get a better result the more granular you are. So having species level models is, tends to be better than genus level models. Okay, so how do, we, how do we further validate this? We thought about going in vivo. Um, it's, it's very hard to get in vivo validation for these types of models. I would love to do a feeding study, but it's, it's very expensive. So we, we, we tried to look around at data sets that already existed. This is a data set from the Sonnenberg Lab, uh, Paper and Cell from 2021, where they fed a bunch of people a high fiber diet and they had an un unexpected result. Generally speaking, people think a high fiber diet should decrease your systemic inflammation. It's supposed to be good for you. But these folks uh, had a 10 week high fiber intervention. Two thirds of them showed a decline in markers of inflammation throughout the body. And one third of them actually showed an increase in systemic inflammation on this high fiber diet. There was not a, a super good explanation for what was driving these phenotypes. So we decided to, to model them. And what we find generally is that predictions for propionate are lower in the high inflammation group compared to the other two groups. Um, and that this actually declines over time. So we have data from, from different time points during this intervention. And for these two groups, there was this decline in propionate production over time as they were on this high fiber diet. Um, so we don't know if this is you know, causally underlying the phenotype, but at least the model is giving us predictions that are somewhat convergent with what we would expect. Um, along those same lines, you know, not direct validation, very indirect, but we have data from a large population of people, about 2,600 people, where we had paired blood data on clinical chemistries. So a bunch of markers you can get at the dock, like your you know, LDL levels and your blood glucose levels. And we had microbiome data, so we could build the models and we could predict short-chain fatty acid profiles. We made a very dumb assumption that they're all eating the standard European diet. I think it's like the Northern, uh, the Northern European diet or the Austrian diet. Um, so that's wrong, uh, but uh, we, you know, we had to start somewhere. So we gave them all this diet and th this is what we find. So in particular, uh, markers of um, cardiometabolic health and inflammation are super associated with butyrate, predicted butyrate production. So people in the population who produce more butyrate tended to have less LDL cholesterol. Um, they tended to have lower triglycerides. Their um, LPIR score, a marker of insulin resistance, was lower. Um, blood pressure was lower. Gracodonic acid was lower. Hormones like adiponectin, which is a good hormone um, that tends to be produced more by lean um, adipose tissue, adipose tissue in lean people, that's also positively associated with, with butyrate. 
Um, so that, that's convergent with what we would expect. You know, butyrate's known to be anti-inflammatory. It's known to have a positive effect on metabolic health. Uh, there's a noisy but significant association between butyrate and body mass index across this population, <clears throat> and propionate did not show this same association. So I don't know if I've convinced you that we have a predictive model for um, short chain fatty acid production across people. We think it's noisily predictive, um, uh, but, but predictive nonetheless. So what can you do with this kind of a thing once you have a, a, a working digital gut that you can use to, to design dietary inputs, what can you do with it? So the, the last figure in this preprint is to sort of um, you know, imagining into this future that we can use this type of modeling for this purpose. We take the same population that I just talked about, 2,600 people, um, and we feed them two different diets. We can just flip their diet in silico from this you know, Austrian diet to a high fiber diet. Um, and then when we do that, we see generally speaking, most people produce more butyrate when you flip them to a high fiber diet, but there's a subset of the population that are non-responders, right? They don't change their butyrate production between the two diets. And there's a, another subset that are, we're calling regressors that show an actual slight decrease in their butyrate production when we switch them to a high fiber diet. So not everybody in this population is saved by a high fiber intervention in terms of butyrate production. So can we, can we save the non-responders? Um, so we tried something very simple. We had three different co-therapies that we could add to the background diets, two different prebiotics, inulin and pectin, which we had shown in our ex vivos were being predicted fairly well by our modeling. Uh, and then Fecalibacterium prasnitzii, which is a, a very well-known butyrate producer in the gut. Um, and it's, you know, its absence is implicated in diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so we can inject this bug into the gut of people. And so when we do this, we find that, you know, yes, we can push people's butyrate production higher than it was on, on either background diet. Um, this heat is just butyrate flux. Um, and the, the specific intervention that's good for any given person is actually kind of all over the map. You know, some people respond really well to a probiotic, right? If they don't have the capacity to produce butyrate, it doesn't matter how much feedstock you push down their, their gullet, they're not going to make butyrate. Um, they need the bug. Uh, other people respond very, very well to just adding one specific prebiotic to the background diet. Um, so yeah, th this is just how one might use the model. I would love to get a, an R01 or a big grant to do an actual human trial to prove that it works. Uh, so, so far it's a little fan, uh, fantasy, uh, fantastical at the moment, uh, and uh, hopefully we can, we can begin to deploy these types of tools, because we're, you know, we're not saying we're gonna do anything too dangerous. I don't wanna give people chemotherapeutics. I just wanna give people broccoli and bananas and stuff. Okay, so then the final story I'll tell is another use case of this modeling framework, um, and this is engraftment prediction. So this is really cool work uh, by a student, Alex Carr, in the group. Again, along with Christian, who's our metabolic modeling um, extraordinaire. And um, so, so what we realized you could, you could easily do in this framework is to take a bug that's not already present in a person's model and just inject it. And then run the model back to steady state and ask, does it achieve a non-zero growth rate or even an appreciable growth, growth rate? Uh, and then once, once you look at that, you can ask, well, what were the metabolic features of that system that predicted its ability to grow or not to grow? And so we first looked at C. diff because it's an important opportunistic pathogen. It needs to first colonize you before it causes trouble. It actually lives as a commensal in many of us. Many of us are carrying C. diff right now and we don't know it. Um, and it doesn't, doesn't hurt you. Uh, maybe someday when you get a round of antibiotics, your immune system's de depleted, it will but it first colonizes you and lives with you at low, low abundance in the gut. Um, so, so we're interested in that early phase of this pathogen where it's behaving as a commensal and just getting into the system. But how do you validate this kind of a thing? You can't give human beings C. diff. That's, uh, IRB's not gonna, not gonna sign off on that. Um, well, there happen to be a couple of data sets. You might recognize these data sets. This is from my postdoc lab, Eric Alm. Uh, and his student um, sequenced their poop over the course of uh, a little over a year, both of them, every single day. And they got these beautiful time series. Um, and for donor A, there happened to be this time point here where a bad piece of French toast was consumed uh, and there was, a, there was a food poisoning event. That red spike is proteobacteria and that's mostly composed of salmonella. Uh, and indeed, he had a salmonella infection and got diarrhea. <clears throat> 
And it turns out that a subsequent paper in I think Nature Microbiology came out where they did kind of a deeper analysis of this data set. They found that C. diff colonized person A at this time point. Uh, even though it was asymptomatic, he didn't get sick from C. diff, it, it got into the system and it stuck for a while. So we wanted to ask if we took our model, built it for all these time points, and tried to inject C. diff at every single time point across the time series, what would happen? Uh, and this is what we get. And now, so this is kind of what prompted us to keep working on this particular problem because it looked kind of good, where you know, we, no matter what we did, no matter how, how much we tried to inject C. diff into this person's time series before this point, we just couldn't get it to grow. It just won't grow in this person's model. But then after this food poisoning event, it does show patchy predictions of being able to grow. The blue is actually, I think, qPCR data of C. diff. It was kind of near the limit of detection. It was very low abundance in this person's system, but we know it was sort of there and persisting in their system throughout this time point, time period. The other person was a more complicated story because they actually had low levels of C. diff in their system throughout the entire time series. Um, they were just colonized by C. diff um, to begin with. They also had some diarrheal events um, in a, a trip to Southeast Asia here. Um, and you can see some of these spikes are, are correlated with, with C. diff spiking and growth rate prediction spiking. But you know, we, our predictions sort of spike somewhat stochastically across the time series, just as the detection of the bug does. Um, so you know, it's a little more complicated interpretation. So we looked at another data set of people who um, had fecal transplants for recurrent C. diff infections, where there was data before the FMT data after the FMT, and then uh, you know, a healthy control group to compare against. So when we look pre-FMT, and we try to inject C. diff into these models, it easily likes to grow in these people's guts, as you might expect. It was only one person that seemed to be, you know, where C. diff did not grow in, in their model. But after FMT, you get this bimodal distribution where some people are protected, C. diff is not predicted to grow, and some people, it, it is predicted to grow. And that mirrors what we see in healthy people. You know, about 40% of a healthy population seems to be invasible by this commensal lifestyle of Clostridioides difficile. We can look at time series um, from this data set post FMT. So this um, UMAP is now a projection of the community, um, I think it's the import flux space. So what is the total community of the whole microbiome, what is it consuming from the diet? Um, and projecting that down into two dimensions for different communities, and then coloring it by the growth rate of C. diff. So the, the points are sort of telling you something about community uh, composition in metabolic consumption space, and then the coloring is telling you about C. diff growth rate uh, when it's invaded into these models. Most people start off in a region of high invasibility, bounce around and end off in a region of less invasibility with the exception of a couple, like uh, this one, for example, where you start and stop in high, high growth regions. Um, we wanted to explore this sort of metabolic niche space of C. diff a bit more in detail. Now what we're looking at is the import flux um, projected down into a UMAP for C. diff itself. So this is just C. diff and what it eats from the media just a vector of all the things that it's consuming from, from, from the media. Uh, and you know, it, it's, it sort of smears out in this space. There may be three clusters, um, a high growth cluster, a sort of intermediate to low growth cluster, and then a cluster of, you know, it's dead, right? It's, it's just not growing in this cluster. And this embedding is the same across these four data sets. So the pattern is very similar across very different populations and data sets. So it seems to have these kind of conserved metabolic niches that are somewhat different. We can actually contextualize these niches in the context of all the taxa in a, in a microbiome. So now I'm taking the import flux data from all the different species in the microbiome. So you know this might be E. coli down here, maybe you know Bacteroides fragilis, what have you. They're all just sort of grayed out. And what we're seeing in color are, again, the, the C. diff growth niches now embedded in this total community space. And, and they're actually quite distinct. Um, you see that C. diff can grow very, in very different kind of lifestyles, it seems, in, in different people's guts, depending on the context of the community that's around it. Um, of course, there's the no growth cluster. All the taxa, actually, that don't grow kind of all get pushed up into this little cluster. Um, but C. diff is, is a little bit over here. There's a lot here, and there's a lot here. What defines these, these different niches? You know, this is the same genome, right? We're not looking at different strains of C. diff. It's the same organism, and it's showing this fairly large degree of, of phenotypic plasticity depending on the community context. Uh, 
In the high growth cluster, these are all the metabolites um, that are being consumed at a fairly high rate. So that's the heat here is the sort of uh, consumption rate of these different metabolites. We see things that we expect, like uh, succinate is known to be important for C. diff growth, trellose, uh, ornithine, and, and a few others. Uh, a lot of these are amino acids in the stickland fermentation um, pathway, which is known to be important for C. diff growth. So a lot of it's stuff that we expect. There's a few surprises in there, but most of it's expected. Um, but what's cool is, is in this intermediate growth cluster, it's just not eating a lot of these, a lot of these metabolites, including ornithine. Um, it's able to make a living, but it's just, it, you know, it's, it's able to kind of exclude this set of metabolites and still grow. And this is the no growth cluster here. The models are very transparent. You can actually look into them and see what taxa are responsible for maybe competing or facilitating C. diff's growth. So when it comes to succinate, you, we, I, you can see that Foca cola, which I believe it was formerly um, Bacteroides vulgatus, um, it is consuming a bunch of succinate in the samples where C. diff doesn't grow. So it's a putative you know, competitor for succinate against C. diff. Um, a lot of these butyrate producing clostridia are producing a bunch of succinate in samples where C. diff is growing quite fast. So li likely cross feeders and facilitators of C. diff growth. Uh, and similar patterns we see for ornithine, for example. So, so what do you do about, about it? You know, how do you, can you decolonize people? Can you prevent um, C. diff from, from getting into people? Well, there's this company, Vedanta, on the East Coast that is designing bugs as drugs. And they had a really cool clinical trial uh, result that came out just a couple months ago uh, for VE303. It's, it's their, their cocktail of eight bugs that's supposed to um, you know, treat recurrent C. diff infections. And uh, it, it showed efficacy. And it showed efficacy in mice first and then in humans later. So we wanted to see if we could take that same cocktail boot it up in silico and inject it into the model. Can we protect people from C. diff engraftment? We could only find six out of the eight bugs in, in, in metabolic model form. So this is a subset of the Vedanta probiotic. Um, but this is generally what we see. Um, we can inject this, this cocktail into the model. The degree to which the growth that these organisms are growing in a given person's model is correlated with suppression of C. diff growth. So the more they're growing, the more C. diff suppressed generally. There's only one example where C. diff was actually stimulated in its growth by these bugs. Um, and there's a bunch of non-responders. There's a lot of people who get the probiotic and they see no effect on C. diff growth. This is also true in the trial, by the way. There were, there were non-responders in the trial. Um, so potentially we're predicting there's a phenomenon. We'd love to get the data from that trial, by the way, but it, we're having trouble getting that. Um, the niche distance between this probiotic cocktail and C. diff itself is associated with, with C. diff growth. So the closer these bugs get to its metabolic niche, the more it collapses it to, to zero growth. Um, and there's a lot of plasticity in that space, actually. You know, these bugs can kind of avoid each other to some extent. And you can see the, the same sort of metabolite heat map. The metabolites that C. diff is consuming here on the left um, in, when, when it's growing quickly are the same set of metabolites that these, these competitors are seemingly eating, right? So a lot of these probiotics are consuming the same metabolites. Um, this black line here is engraftment. So we can find that some of these probiotics are engrafting in pretty much every individual we apply them to, whereas others are only engrafting in a subset. And this, this seems to be somewhat explaining the responder, non-responder status, um, which opens up the door to designing other modulated cocktails of bugs that could treat these non-responders. So I think I'm a little over time. I'll, I'll stop there. A couple of, um, of the preprints that we just had out showing use cases of this metabolic modeling platform we've developed. Ultimately, we'd love to build this sort of gut digital twin that can be leveraged for precision nutrition, precision medicine. Um, there's a, lot, a long way to go, uh, but you know, we've made some exciting progress. Thanks to Alex, Nick, Christian, and Joe for the hard work on these papers to the whole lab and to the funders, and thanks to all of you for listening.
that, so we did do that, and that so I was showing the propionate production. Those are those box plots. So that was actually a model output. So we were focusing on the short chain fatty acids because we're writing a paper about short chain fatty acids. We could dig more into the details of those models for sure, but of those SCFAs, only propionate showed a correspondence with the phenotype. So it seemed if you made less propionate, you were more likely to be one of these non-responders to the to the diet. Um, oh, of course, that's modeling. You know, I don't know if that's actually what's happening in situ, but. Yeah. So do you think that could be the way they interact? Because I think the power of your model is you can say how is my tax science interacting across the distance. Yeah, and you know what throws it throws a, a wrench into the gears there a little bit is everyone has a different composition too, right? So it, it would be nice if everyone had the same you know, you're only changing a few things at a time and you could really look at that contextual thing across a small population like this. I think the problem there is this, there's a lot of variation in the microbiome composition across those individuals. So pinning anything on a single taxon was tough. The alpha diversity wasn't predictive, right? So richness wasn't predictive of whether you were a responder or non-responder. Um, there were a few weak associations on the taxa side, but um, nothing as strong as, as the metabolic model prediction um, in, in explaining the phenotype. Yeah, and I've seen some interesting talks on how <clears throat> some of these dietary fibers actually have a bit of a homology to like um, fungal polysaccharides, and so the, the innate immune system can actually see them as um, pro-inflammatory if, if too much of them are residual and not being broken down by the microbes. So there's these immune effects that we, we aren't capturing in our, in our metabolic model, but I think that interpretation is consistent with the propionate result, right? Because if you're converting fewer of the fibers into these SCFAs, if your microbiome is less primed to make more of these SCFAs, there's going to be more of that fiber sitting around to cause these types of problems. Yeah. There'll be bottle effects over time, right? The, and the composition will start to look very different from what it was in vivo. Um, we don't use a medium. Poop is the medium. Yeah, so what we find is if we, even if we just add PBS, we get a bunch of growth. Still, we, there's, a, there's a bunch of residual fiber and nutrition in the stool itself, and you don't need to add anything. Uh, and we're keeping our incubations fairly short, just a few hours. Uh, so that's, that's what the trade-off we're making, is we, we keep them very short, and we don't add that much. Maybe we add one thing, like inulin, for example. Yeah. Uh, you made the case really well that the model is predictive across a broad range of projects and questions. But just to be annoying about it, <laughs> uh, you always want to do better, right? And so I'm just interested in it's just kind of a broad question, so you can take it where you want to. But do you think the route to making the model perform better lies in the initial formulation, like the things you're optimizing? You, you said you've been quite creative or you've thought beyond what we would have done before in terms of formulating the flux balance constraints. So that's one thing. Or, and I know you've worked on things like, you know, very ecological mechanisms like disturbance and so on, or the things that might depart from the assumptions of how you set up the model, more ecological mechanisms that might be missing. So if you have to say what makes it better, is it making the FBA better, or is it different ecological mechanisms that aren't in there yet? Yeah, great, great question. Um, it's hard to say. 
I think there's a bunch of parallel problems that need to be solved at once. You know, one big one was how do you formulate the FBA that's biologically appropriate to the system. And we, so our working model is that the gut is this boom and bust nutrient environment where it's not exactly steady state, um, but it's not exactly not steady state. You have this bolus of material that comes through and gets excreted, and there's another bolus that is right behind it. And that this type of nutrient environment, this boom and bust environment, leads to this situation where you have different growth rates for different taxa that can be estimated through approximating these dynamical methods. And I think that was like a, a problem we had to solve to get the system to work well in poop. That problem is going to be a different problem if you're working in soil or lakes. You know, I don't think our method is going to apply very well to different systems, depending. And then on the on the model side, as far as the the gems or the genome scale models, there, you know, we're not we don't have the same exact strain in our database as we have in the sample, and there's going to be mismatches. Uh, we know that is in tr introducing noise. The better our databases get, the the more improvements we should see in the modeling. And finally, the diet. We know, that, like. We, we, from experience, the better we can approximate the diet, the better we can explain the data. And often we have very bad approximations of what the dietary intake is. And so improving diet, improving the gem databases, and then you know, really thinking hard about how your model applies to the very specific use case of, of what you're modeling uh, all, all need to be thought of hard. Okay, well, I think we're out of time.